Daily African. Well, hello and welcome to Talk Time. And this week, we are talking about the National Democratic Congress, Ghana and the world. And we are particularly privileged to have a very, very distinguished person in the studio for this conversation. Welcome to Talk Time. Welcome back to Talk Time. And as I indicated from the very beginning, we are talking about the National Democratic Congress. We're going to be talking about Ghana and we'll be talking about the world. And our guest is special. We're going to be talking to Mr. Johnson Asedu Inketia, National Chairman of the party, otherwise known as General Mosquito. General, welcome to our studios. Thank you, my comrade. <laughs> <laughs> General, let's start with the state of your party. What is the state of your party? Where is your party at at this moment? Thank you very much, Kwesi, and let me uh, greet our listeners. It's been a long while since <laughs> I appeared here. I intend to be more regular in the coming months. Thank you, sir. Well, the state of our party is healthy and strong and poised for battle come December 2027. That is this year. Um, 2024, that is this year. Are you winning the elections? Sure. We what? can't do otherwise. What, what do you see the us. confidence that you are winning this election? Well, it's about preparation. So that uh, hard on the training grounds, easy on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And that is why we are not approaching this election with any complacency at all. And I'm confident that the type of effort we are putting in will certainly yield positive results. That gives me the sense of confidence that we are winning the election. From those of us who are outside, it does appear that there is some focus on the Ashanti region. Are we right or wrong? Well, there is some focus there, but that is not everything that we are doing. <laughs> we, are, we are doing many other things. The reason you could uh, sense and feel the extra focus on the Ashanti region is to uh, you know, deal with some of the problems at source. So we are focusing extra effort in Ashanti region and Eastern region. So, but that doesn't mean that we are, we are you know, relaxing in the other regions. Why this focus? Is it because these two regions haven't been your stronghold? Is it because you're seeing new signs? What is the reason for this, this apparent new focus? The new focus is that when, as a surgeon, you operate a patient, you certainly will focus where the disease is. <laughs> and, that is where, and that is why we are focusing. Mm. Um, it has become clear that uh, as a party, we have some disease in those specific areas. And so that's why we are trying to tackle some of the problems at source. And uh, besides that, we have 16 regions all right. But uh, election is about data. So uh, for some of the regions, when you combine the total voter population, it can be wiped up by maybe one constituency in the Ashanti region. Mm -hmm. And so if presidential election is about numbers, you must give, if you want to give equitable treatment, then it means that when you come to region by region, Ashanti will appear to be having, uh, you know, extra focus. But when you go according to the numbers and the population, you see that we are trying to spread our efforts equitably so we can get uh, optimum results. In this election, upcoming election, mm. 
what do you think are the main issues around which you are going to fight? What are the main issues? Well, it's not about my opinion, but uh, survey upon survey um, have revealed the issues that are of major concern to Ghanaians. And top uh, on the list is economy and jobs for the youth. And then down there you come, I think number four or so is corruption and, and many other things. So we are designing our campaign strategies to respond to the felt needs of the electorates. How far have you gone? I mean, that, does that entail uh, preparation of a manifesto? What is it that you're doing? Uh, sure, How far sure. Have you gone? In actual fact, I'm just returning from, <laughs> <laughs> from, from a policy dialogue which we have been engaged in over the years. So after um, we lost the elections 2020, the group that was engaged in uh, developing uh, our manifesto did not go to bed. They've been working continuously, revising the manifesto based on emerging uh, challenges and, and, and all that. So. We are we we are far advanced at uh, you know developing the manifesto of which we will be going into the election. And as I said to you, I'm just returning from one of the penultimate policy dialogues in order to firm up our, our policy proposals. And also, we've been working on uh, strategizing for this election, but that I'm not going to go into any <laughs> details. <laughs> so that is also there. So we think we have um, two main problems confronting us. Number one, we believe that all Ghanaians accept now that uh, the country has been uh, going through some decay for the past uh, seven years and that decay ought to be stopped. It can only be stopped when you remove the agent that is creating the decay. So that's one of the major challenges facing the country. Mm -hmm. The second one is that if you remove the decay or the, the agent causing the decay, uh, then the, you haven't uh, finished. You need now to repair the decay mm -hmm. and then to return the country onto the path of growth. That is why we are focusing our attention in these two areas, strategizing to win the elections by dislodging MPP and then what to do immediately after the elections so that, uh, uh, and I'm emphasizing immediately because Ghanaians seem to be losing some confidence in our democratic experiment. And so there is the need to uh, re-energize their confidence in the system. And they must feel that something new is going to happen. And so we will not have time at all um, to waste. So we don't think that Ghanaians will tolerate us if after winning the election, we sit down and, you know, even constituting government is a problem, let alone mm -hmm. a beginning uh, with the changes that they are, they are expecting. So that is why we need to prepare in advance so that immediately uh, we are sworn into office, we hit the ground running. And we need to also um, um, you know, think through our policies well, not to come and be doing knee-jerk <laughs> approaches and experimentation and so on. We Ghanaians will not forgive us because we've been there before and they expect us to have learned lessons from where there were mistakes. And so they will expect much more from us than uh, when we're coming to power for the first time. So. We need to, you know, let Ghanaians feel right from the day of the swearing in that a new wind is blowing. Things are not going to be done the same way that 
they've been done in the past. And then we need to also demonstrate our readiness to face the challenges, to, to disentangle the, what I perceive to be state capture, disentangle the structures of the state capture and work to renew the confidence of Ghanaian in, in our democratic institutions. General, you must be intensely aware of the fact that Ghanaians are fed up with platform promises. Sure. How is that going to impact your campaign strategy? We, we, we are just fed up fed with up the with promises. Class. Yes. That is why we are very modest in the things we are going to promise. The, the biggest one we are promising is to restore the country back to the path of growth generally. And in doing so, we believe that uh, the little resource we have, <laughs> we are better off concentrating on completion of ongoing projects and abandoned projects and so on. We will not be rushing into uh, creating another set of projects which we will leave uncompleted. Because I, at times I sit down to think and I realize that look, from Osaji first time, when CPP was overthrown, when you pick all the uncompleted projects through all the other governments to date and you convert them into money, mm. you find out that, Kwesi, <laughs> they may be more than our national income now, our GDP now. Mm -hmm. So what has happened? We just threw our money away and then we are sitting down begging. Mm -hmm. So we think that there must be a paradigm shift where we, we emphasize on continuing projects started by our predecessors. Look, Cocoa Board is in crisis now. Why? There was Cocoa Roots project which was funded by money taken out from outside. The projects were stopped and abandoned. The rain has washed majority of the uncompleted ones away. So we are back. The condition of the roads is back to status quo ante. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, nobody can stop our creditors from taking their money from us. So we are paying for roads that we did not construct. Mm -hmm. So it's like throwing the money down the drain. And it is just one example. If you compare this, you, you take into account, uh, you know, Osajifo, what Osajifo left, and then what the NLC left, and, and so on up to today. You realize that we just work, and then the reason we do this is that there is some, I don't know how to describe it, some, some pride in, in telling people that these are my projects 100%, they were begun by me and completed by me, so I can only take credit for projects that I initiate and complete. What the hell that pride gives us, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying that we have, we have inherited this project, we've continued, it is now working and delivering, uh, you know, resource, and delivering income to the country. And because of that, we are able to generate enough revenues to pay for uh, the loan or whatever facility we, are, we, we use to develop it. Mm -hmm. So that pride, mediocre thinking that I, must, I can only take pride in a project that I start myself and finish. And that when I finish somebody's project, mm. some people will say that it is not your project. So I've never engaged in this debate of this is our project, that is his project, this is our project, because it, 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 it does not help the country at all. But there are some who say mm -hmm. that we are bankrupt, we are broke, mm -hmm. there's no money. Yeah. Even to continue projects started by your predecessors, mm -hmm. there's simply no money. Is that true? 
And if that is true, how are you going to find the resources <laughs> to do any project whatsoever? Well, this is a double barrel uh, <laughs> question. I cannot say it is true. And so I will not be able to uh, build the next answer based on the fact that we are bankrupt, we don't have money. Because uh, those who claim we are bankrupt, they are still in charge of the economy and the profligacy has not stopped. So if we are completely bankrupt, where is the money coming from to sustain that profligate expenditure? Look at uh, our budget and expenditure for this Afghan in Cote d'Ivoire. When you compare it with other countries which are far richer than us, can you be convinced that indeed those who are at the helm of affairs accept that we are bankrupt? They are boring and dropping. <laughs> then number two, I just saw something, I don't know whether it is fake news or proper news that uh, government is budgeting 150, has uh, secured 150 million funding for the patching of potholes. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, man, that is true. Because see, how were the potholes created in the first place? <laughs> you see, so when you look at these things, and the fact that we had a system of generating revenue mm -hmm. to fix these potholes, and we decided to abandon that system, and now we are going to borrow to come and fix <laughs> the potholes. These potholes and uh, maintenance of our roads was being funded through uh, toll, uh, you know, mm -hmm. road tolls. The same government that says the road tolls, you know, have, have lived their usefulness, let's abandon it. You open our roads for all these heavy trucks. Trans, some of them transcontinental. I mean, coming mm -hmm. from Sahel. Mm -hmm. The size of the Sahelian articulators is even <laughs> bigger than what we have in Ghana. And the load they carry, they all pass through free without contributing anything towards the maintenance of roads. And you now have to go and borrow 150 million to come and fix potholes. Mm -hmm. That's one of the problems. See, so we, we, it is doable. When we come and we commit ourselves to it, it can be done. And even though people are claiming we are that uh, the country is broke, it is not all the citizens in the country that are broke. There must be ways out of it. For instance, you see, the latest means of uh, hiding laundered money is real estate. People steal money and they put it in real estate. And the structures, since it was announced that our economy has collapsed, has the construction stopped? The big, big construction is going on in, in Accra and in our major cities. It hasn't stopped. The cranes are up there. Mm -hmm. So if we dedicate ourselves to it and uh, we, we attach more seriousness to <laughs> property rating. Mm -hmm. It can generate more money than many, many other taxes will bring in. Mm -hmm. So even if somebody has stolen our money, as in government, is able to put up 12 houses, 15 houses, and so on. And you are... Uh, taking property rate. If he cannot, mean, he cannot pay, he will have to sell some of the houses mm -hmm. to pay the property rate of there. That is part of the recovery. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there are ideas that can be used to, you know, at least continue some of the projects that they themselves will generate more revenues and we can be back to where we started. We have many other countries have gone, have sunk even further than where we are now. 
and uh, we shouldn't throw our hands in the air that everything is bad so let's let's stop it has to be done like in the words of uh, <laughs> is it if mm -hmm. he says the work has to be done who will do it it is us who should do it we are not the children of Ghana. We are the parents of the new Ghana that we want to build. Well, we were, we were talking with Mr. Johnson Nasidu Nketia, National Chairman of the National Democratic Congress. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, I'd like to ask some question. You know, the NDC is so confident it is coming to power. I'd like to know what are the first things that they are going to do when they assume power on January 7th, 2025. What are the first things should be, should be expecting from an NDC government? Short break. Welcome back to Talk Time, and we are in conversation with Mr. Johnson Nasidu Nketia, National Chairperson of the National Democratic Congress. Sir, yes. January 7th, 2025, you're back in office. What would you do from January 7th? <laughs> I'm being tempted to peep into our manifesto but i'll resist but the temptation <laughs> i'll resist the temptation partly but speaking for myself as i said Ghanaians need to feel that there is a wind of change blowing first of all we must protect documents because we've been there before Documents about corrupt deals and all that were shredded before we came to office. I remember we had a policy uh, that was announced that uh, some people should remain in office for some time whilst we prepare and so on. I don't think that that is the way that we should approach this transition. And that is why uh, I think that we should be prepared to announce our government as quickly as possible so that we can protect the integrity of uh, the documents that we have. Ghanaians are expecting uh, accountability, holding people accountable for what they have done wrong. We are not going to engage in witch hunting and all that if there are no witches. Hmm. But Ghanaians expect we owe it to ourselves and owe it to Ghanaians and the generations unborn that nobody should mess up with our resources, the country's resources, and get away with them. So I think quickly we would have to find out how we can hold people accountable. But we will not be looking backwards alone. We have to be looking forward and backwards so that we demonstrate to the new NDC government that we are not in to compete in who can loot more. So, so, so that whilst we are holding uh, previous duty bearers to account, we set example that, look, it will not be tolerated. What is wrong in the previous government will, will not be tolerated in the current or future government. So I believe that if we are able to demonstrate that we have come, we are going to protect the people's space. We are prepared to do all the work that will restore the country back to its past glories. We will have sympathies across, together with our friends, with the population. We were here during the revolution, the Rawlings' revolution. The, the situation in the country, as far as the economy was concerned, arguably was worse than this as at the time we took over. But we were able to sustain 
the confidence in the masses in what we were doing and we were able to uh, reawaken the, the patriotism in the ordinary people mm -hmm. and everybody brought their, their, their hands on deck. We were able to uh, scale the difficulties. So I think that is a job that we need to focus on in the very early uh, stages of our new government. Uh, so I think those are the things we'll be doing. But when it comes to uh, actual policy measures in government, I prefer to leave that one. <laughs> no problem. Yes. I've been listening to radio quite a bit. Yes. And many of your supporters are threatening to jail mm -hmm. officials of this administration who they think have been corrupt. So who will jail you? Are you going to be jailing them? No, I don't think that anybody in our government has the capacity to jail anybody. Jailing is the, the issue with the courts. But we will punish wrongdoers. LBG Temakro mm -hmm. actually is insisting on prosecution of previous officials. Oh, if there is evidence to prosecute wrongdoers, it, it depends on the categorization you are talking about. <laughs> I don't see them, I, and I don't want to paint them as previous government officials. I'm saying if you are doing house cleaning, it has to involve everybody. They may be previous government officials with collaborators inside us. So if you get those collaborators, what are you going to do to them? And so I don't, I'm not comfortable with the term previous government officials as if when we come, then the searchlight for corruption is going to, yes, focus on a particular set of people and that all the other others who are outside that are free. No, yeah, we are saying that the laws of this country were made for all of us. So when we come, we would uh, look at how to apply the law to protect state property. And if anybody has stolen state property, that person will account for his activities. But I won't want to call them MPP people or previous government officials or current government officials. We are saying any and everybody who has done something wrong would have to be, uh, who face the music. Some of your members are also living. Mm -hmm. Really livid, saying that this time there'll be no father for all. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, maybe they are referring to the previous time, Professor Mills' time, when it was announced that uh, DCEs of the previous government should remain, some appointees should remain, and uh, they were there shredding <laughs> documents to cover up their corrupt deals, and so maybe that is what they are talking about. And maybe. They are talking about us also repeating what MPP has done differently. Mm -hmm. If we think that MPP has um, compromised our state institutions by ensuring that everybody who works in there is MPP, if you are not MPP, you are hounded out and then uh, others are brought in and so on. Some of them, admittedly, that is what they are thinking about. Mm -hmm. But what will appease such people? Two things, but I will choose one. Some are demanding that, let us repeat what they have done. So pay them back. And pay them back. There is a better way to approach it. If we are able to find out who were removed wrongly. And as much as possible, if they can be restored. And who were brought in wrongly, as much as possible, can be removed. Then we can all go back <laughs> to the laws to, to begin. But what the party people would not accept is for us to come and say that, well, uh, let bygones be bygones, but those who are occupying those positions wrongly must be protected to remain there. I think that will be too much because if they were put there wrongly, they will continue doing the wrong things. But everybody knows 
the rules as to how people get to certain offices. If those rules are found to have been breached, then of course the correction must be done. But there are some areas where this problem is critical. Mm -hmm. For example, the security service, mm -hmm. the electoral commission as yeah, well. Yeah. If it's found that these areas have been packed with party loyalists, what are you going to do? Police, that's military, why I'm, that's why I'm saying customs. That. There is a way of getting recruited in the security. There's a way of getting recruited in all other government agencies. I am saying we will stick by the law. So if anybody got there wrongly, the law will expose that person mm -hmm. for what he is. Okay, so if when you take the national constitution, if you are, you are elected in parliament or government uh, or president and uh, something is discovered which if it were known before you became an MP or a president, you wouldn't have qualified to be an MP or president. Mm. Then you go home. So the same principle will apply to everybody. So if you are found to have been recruited wrongly, we will pursue the law and see how those things can be dealt with. Mm. So the important thing mm -hmm. is to make sure that you stick by the law. And if you stick by the law, you are always safe. And you are not creating any uh, precedence for some chain reaction in future. This is the f if this is the first time that uh, recruitment processes have been breached, you know everybody who was recruited. And if you compare that process with the law, you know those who were recruited wrongly. And it becomes easier to uh, isolate them and, 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 and treat them the way they should be treated according to law. So why did you go back to the IPAC? Well, we gave reasons for not going back to the IPAC. And uh, we got assurances that uh, our concerns uh, have been addressed. So there was no reason to stay away. For instance, we said that the IPAC was put in place to help develop consensus in many, many subjects which cannot be legislated in their nitty gritties. So in every democracy, consensus is a major part of it. And so we put the IPAC there it was not based on any law. But we established conventions as to how we, the consensus positions were generated and through the activities of IPAC, we're able to achieve a lot of improvement in our electoral uh, process. Mm -hmm. Now came uh, Madame Jean and her team, and they decided to treat IPAC differently. And at some point, we got convinced. <coughs> we got convinced that IPAC has abandoned, deviated from its purpose, so there was no point being there. And so, sorry. So following our <coughs> workout from IPAC, there have been a lot of uh, engagements behind the scenes, some led by Peace Council and many other institutions. So we got to a point where we felt that, well, they had given indication that IPAC will revert to its uh, consensus building ways. And so we, 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 we thought that we should give it a try. That's why we are back. But there's still <coughs> concerns about the Electoral Commission and what it may do. One of those concerns has to do with the alleged appointment of card-bearing party members onto the commission. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll get the bridge <laughs> and cross it. But you can see the bridge. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I say we'll get there. <laughs> when you get there, you'll cross it. When we get there, we'll cross it. Since because January, there is, as I have said, there are rules uh, about the appointment of commissioners. 
So if we are there and we go back to the rules and we find out certain things were done against the rules, the rules themselves will prescribe our next line of action. Are you satisfied since you went back to IPAC how it has worked? Well, we've just attended, uh, I think, one or two meetings. Two? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I've not attended myself because now <laughs> my position has changed. So <laughs> it's only where there are very critical issues that I attend. Mm -hmm. But uh, our delegation to IPAC feel that, well, it is worth continuing. What about your, your boycott of one particular radio station? Mm -hmm. Your friend's radio station. Which is <laughs> it? Your friend. Kennedy. <laughs> Peace FM. Oh, uh, Kwame. Yes. I, I think like we've gone know. beyond that. Yeah. We've gone beyond that because uh, we have had several uh, backdoor uh, engagements and so on. So, as far as I'm concerned, it is not no longer an issue. I think our communication department was, was expecting some get together, you know, by our side and uh, Kwame, so that we can pop some champagne and, and seal the deal. <laughs> so that's all. But there is there's no actual issue now to be to. Be so we should be expecting you back on peace of very soon. I think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go for another short break. And when we come back, I'm going to ask General a question he may not be too comfortable with, but a question which is just begging to be asked. <laughs> short break. Well, welcome back to Talk Time. And... Uh, the general is here with us. General Mosquito is here with us. Uh, Mr. Johnson Nasidu Nkitia, National Chairman of the National Democratic Congress. Now, sir. Yes. Do you or do you not know who President John Muhammad's running mate is going to be? Well, I don't know for a fact. But everybody, like the way we all stay close to, <laughs> everybody can guess. Everybody is expecting that three will drop. <laughs> everybody can guess. So <laughs> I, I have not been informed officially in my capacity as a national chairman what the decision of President Mahama is. I'm only interested in trying to hold him to his word that by the end of uh, the second week or by the middle of the third month, uh, we should know the running mate. So as far as I'm concerned, with my executive, that is what we are working on. But who is this mystery person that everybody knows that the rest of us don't know? This mystery person, who is that? Well. It's in the head of President Mahama. We don't know. <laughs> but you appear to have a way to the head of President Mahama. No, we are saying that the timetable, because we need to do our things according to our own uh, strategy. So we can hold him to the timetable to tell us what is in his mind. But it but appears that all of you... he tells us... It appears that all know. of you know who the animate is going to be. I don't know. If you have other any people idea. Know. If other people. Oh, I can have ideas based on projections and, and other things, the same way that our party has done things in the past and, and so on. But I may be wrong, I may be right. That is why I don't want to uh, put uh, any conjecture out there. What is the quality you're looking for? Of course, you know, we share some beliefs, and that is that. We don't believe in uh, this uh, where you come from, north, south, what language you speak, and, and all this. We don't believe that. Right? Uh, I, I know you don't believe in that. Of one. course not. There's a job to be done. 
So we are looking for who is best cut to do that job. That's all. So that is our first consideration. All the other things about religion, uh, where you come from, and, and all that, gender, and all that, they are secondary. First, you look at the quality of the person for the job, if he's able to do it. Mm. We go for it because you are not electing just a leader for the party. You are electing a leader for the country. And all the difficulties, some of which we have spoken about this morning, they need leadership to be able to handle. Mm -hmm. So you need to look beyond the election that who is best cut to do the, the job. So when the name comes to us, that will be our first query. Find out, is that person up to the tax? We are going to ask the nation to assign to him or her. If you are able to satisfy that one, then we get to the other considerations. But do you have people in the party mm -hmm. who would meet the requirement? You know, in the NPP, for example, they are looking outside. They are looking at some Osofu and so on. <laughs> you know, do you have the people in your party, or you also be tempted to look we outside? We have more than more than uh, we require. We are not going to do the Osofu trick to pick somebody and now try to convert the person or what? <laughs> no, to pick somebody because you can recite the Bible. You know. The job is not about Bible recitation <laughs> because you are going to be a, a vice president of the republic. You are going to undertake some difficult job of reconstructing or helping to reconstruct a damaged nation. So it's not about your religion and so on. If it's about religion, well, there are several bishops and popes around, or uh, imams around, for that matter, and so it's not about that. Or fetish priests. Or fetish priests, or ulomo, and all that, they are all around. But if we are going to offer prayers, and you are looking for a fetish priest or ulomo or something that's different. But we, we have a job, we already know the requirements of the job. So all that we are looking for is the qualities of the prospective candidates. Fit them in the job uh, requirements. If they can do it, you know it. If they cannot do it and you put uh, them there, you are fixing a square peg in a round hole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You may think that uh, this will win as elections. But winning elections is not an end in itself. Winning elections and being able to satisfy the population, you know, about what you intend to, the changes you intend to bring in their lives and so on. So that is much more important than just the activity of winning elections. You know, you are a very experienced person, done many things before, banking, Thank you. parliament, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. <laughs> yes. One of the things that you've done... That won't happen. That <laughs> <laughs> won't happen. <laughs> yes. I've distilled appetency, I've tapped power wine, all those. Wow. Yes, yes. <laughs> but you were in parliament. Yes, I, I was in parliament for 12 years. So you have some parliamentary experience. Sure, sure, okay. sure. Now, to start with, you had your own difficulties mm -hmm. when it came to the replacement of Mr. Haruna Idrisu. Mm -hmm. And I guess that some of the difficulty continues up to today. Mm -hmm. The MPP is in the same hot waters. Mm -hmm. How do you see the problem of the selection of parliamentary leadership? How may it be done? Well, you see, the selection of parliamentary leadership has been a problem since the Second or Third Republic. You remember the Kwakuba, Usha Champo problem and so on. And I think that uh, since becoming General Secretary, I kept reminding our party structures that there is a vacuum that we need to fill. 
but it's like when we constitute leadership of parliament and it's accepted for the time being, then everybody goes to bed. We don't deal with the problem. Some way, somehow, um, because NDC has always had a former MP in, their lead, in our leadership, the top leadership, the three people on the top since NDC was formed, we've always had a former MP there. The first uh, set of chairman, co-chairman, you have Monofie as a former MP before. Then we came to Obeda Samoa, former MP. And then uh, we came to our turn. I was a former MP. Dr. Kwabranje was a former MP. And, and, and all that up to today. So somehow in private discussions with MPP, I've always been telling them that the part, the nation and our democracy will be better served if we encourage former MPs to take positions at their national party level. Mm -hmm. So far, they've not been able to do that. But what I'm dragging at is that there is parliament. And parliament, by the constitution, uh, are empowered to regulate their own uh, processes and in parliament. OK. They do that by uh, doing uh, preparing standing orders that are the rules. The standing orders are very silent about how the parties elect their leadership in parliament. If they are referring to a party leader in parliament, they just refer to the person as the leader of NDC, leader of MPP, leader of majority, leader of this in parliament. They assume it, and then that's all. So there is no procedure at all in the, in the standing orders about how party leaders are elected. That tells you that <laughs> the rules of parliament do not cover how parties elect leadership among the uh, MPs the party has sponsored to parliament. Now, when you, and then uh, in the past, MPs, if they were, satisfied, they were dissatisfied with their parties, could cross carpet and join other parties and remain in parliament. This 1992 constitution it's different because moving, arguing from the point that elections constitute the signing of a social contract between a political party and the electorate. And that once the, uh, the, the parties prepare what they will do mm. and sell that to um, the electorate together with the candidates. They, they, they are trusting to implement what they are, they are promising. So when the candidate buy, the, the electorate buy into it, it means the social contract has been signed. And so when you get into government, you come to implementation time. Mm -hmm. And so the candidates you have sold to the electorates, mm -hmm. You are expected to use those candidates to implement the program which has been bought into by the electorate. So if the candidate comes to parliament and decides that I no longer believe in the programs of that party, then the law says, leave parliament and go back. Take another program and sell it to the electorate. Mm -hmm. If they buy into it, you return to parliament. Mm -hmm. If they don't buy into it, you are out of here. It means you, you are not part of the region. You go home. So this 92 constitution actually uh, firms up the fact that the MPs in parliament continue to be uh, you know, constitute an important wing of the party. Now, when you look at our 
individual party constitutions. In our constitution, we uh, have created four wings. Lately, we have added one. So we have five wings of the party, mm -hmm. apart from the main party structure. We have some semi-autonomous wings, and there are five. First one is youth wing, second women's wing, third um, um, international wing, and then you have the parliamentary wing. And we have just added Zongo Kokos a few years ago. Now, our constitution stipulates that we have to develop regulations for the running of these wings. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the past, it has not happened. I think we used to have one for the youth wing uh, during E.T. Mensah's term, but since a lot of changes came, so it became still. So, as at the time I took over as a national chairman, we didn't have any regulations for any of these wings. Mm -hmm. So we have embarked, together with the national executive, we have embarked on the process of developing the legal framework based upon which these our wings should run. We just completed the youth wing and we've used that one as a standard. We are, uh, um, you know, in advanced stages of uh, producing the, uh, the the caucus regulations, the parliamentary caucus regulations, the uh, jungle caucus regulations, and the women's wing regulations, and then the international wing regulations. When these things are firmed up, and they will be done, they are done with uh, uh, together with the various wings, the leadership of the wings. So um, some of the drafts emanate from our side. In fact, the draft that will regulate our caucus emanated from the caucus themselves. So it's on the table, which we are trying to firm up. Immediately, we, we, we pass these ones. Then all these issues about who appoints or elect our leader in parliament and all these things will be addressed, addressed with finality. But the key argument is that no political party caucus in parliament can declare themselves independent from the party. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, because the constitution itself says that the parties sponsor those candidates there. And the constitution recognizes that once you are sponsored by the party, you are bound to do the bidding of the party. And any point in time you want to declare your independence from the party, you must lose your seat and go back and then uh, come under a different sponsorship. Either you sponsor yourself or somebody else sponsors you. Mm -hmm. So. I think that I don't know what the provisions in the MPP constitutions are, but I think these are the areas we should be looking at to address the, the principles first. There is the need for people to be involved in the choice of their leadership, no doubt about that. But there is also the contract that somebody has sponsored those people who want to choose their leadership. So there can be a middle way somewhere where everybody's interests will be catered for. If you look at what happens at the district assembly level, for instance, that same argument has been there. There is a government in power, a president who has been elected to you know, implement his agenda and all that, that to involve district assemblies, participation, and so on. But there are people who have also been elected on their own. They've contested election and they've been elected to uh, uh, district assemblies. How do you choose their leadership? It's been a question. And at the, that level, there has been a solution. And that is somebody may nominate for other people to approve and so on. So we are looking, we can look through many of these things and we will get an acceptable a solution to deal with these problems. And I believe if we are able to get it, 
it will it will be a, a standard for other parties in in the country. I don't know in the case of uh, Honorable Haruna Idrisu. Mm. Yeah. It does appear mm -hmm. that there's still some bitterness. Mm. How are you coping with that? How are you dealing with that? See, the important thing is that you can deviate from the principles and you can deviate from the law, unfortunately. Uh, I don't think that appeasement is a good method to govern with. So, if... <laughs> there is a, a decision. It is not everybody who will be happy with the division, decision. And in fact, in many, many ways, when a position is lost to you, you are a human being. You feel peeved. But over time, you grow right. But I don't see a problem with Honorable Harun and the way you are seeing it. Because he has come over. And, uh, we are it's not about him, mm -hmm. you know. You get the indication that some of his supporters, some of the people who really mm -hmm. appreciate his leadership and so mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. appear to be bitter. Well, their bitterness will abate over time because we'll be talking to them. Because uh, we don't take decisions based on who will be bitter and who will not be bitter. If we think that this is the best way to go, because always when you are taking decisions, in an organization, you take decisions that will be that will secure the interests of the organization, and by extension, uh, if anybody is implementing any policy in this country, they look at the policy that will benefit the greater <coughs> number of people in the country. But if you want to implement a policy that will satisfy every individual. It cannot happen, then you are not prepared to govern. So um, if the, you are convinced that the basis of your, of, your, of your decision is valid, I think that you have to find ways of dealing with the fallout. But that is not to change the decision. And so uh, everybody will grow up because uh, and this is not the first time of changing leadership in parliament. And it certainly is not going to be the last time of changing leadership. In fact, the time that we were uh, changing leadership that brought Honorable Haruna, Honorable Muntaka and Co on board, I raised this issue that there is some amount of um, uncertainty or try and error at the method of choosing our leaders. And we, this thing must be dealt with. Unfortunately, it was never dealt with until I, I found myself in a situation that I had to take some decision. And so there was no <laughs> law or anything. We had to rely on any system that we, but after that, we have since agreed with the caucus and with uh, uh, Council of Elders and Leadership, that the way to go is to finalize the regulations and that it will bring clarity to the processes of selecting uh, leadership. And I, I, I believe that at that point, these issues about uh, uh, who is wrong in, in, in taking what decision will be a thing of the past. You know, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so you. very much for coming to the studio. Yeah, now, viewers, we've been talking to Mr. Johnson Asidun Ketia, National Chairman of the National Democratic Congress, and we hope that this conversation has shed light on one or two issues that may have not been very clear to you and so on. He will come back again. He will come back many times in the course of this year to answer questions about his party and Ghana. And once more, we'd like to thank him very, very much. We'd like to thank him profusely okay. for coming to the studio and sharing his thoughts with us. We'll see you again next week. It's goodbye from me, from Pan-African Television.
from producer, director, George Villain, and everybody who contributed to make this show possible. Bye-bye.